morning, and welcome to Oniton Hall, one of the largest estates in the area. My name's Nick, and I'm one of the guides. I'll give you a brief introduction to the estate while you're sitting down, and then we'll walk round. The estate consists of the house, gardens, parkland, and farm, and it dates back to the 14th century. The original house was replaced in the late 17th century, and of course it has had a large number of owners. Almost all of them have left their mark, generally by adding new rooms, like the ballroom and conservatory, or by demolishing others. The farm looks much as it's always done, although the current owner has done a great deal of work to the flower beds. In the 17th century, the estate was owned by a very wealthy man called Sir Edward Downs. His intention was to escape from the world of politics, after years as an active politician, and to build a new house worthy of his big collection of books, paintings, and sculptures. He broke off contact with his former political allies. And hosted meetings of creative and literary people, like painters and poets. Unusually for his time, he didn't care whether his guests were rich or poor, as long as they had talent. Big houses like Oniton had dozens of servants until the 1920s or 30s, and we've tried to show what their working lives were like. Photographs, of course, don't give much of an idea. So instead, as you go round the house, you'll see volunteers dressed up as nineteenth-century servants going about their work. They'll explain what they're doing and tell you their recipes or what tools they're using. We've just introduced this feature to replace the audio guide. We used to have available. I see there are a number of children here with you today. Well, we have several activities, especially for children, like dressing up in the sorts of clothes that children wore in the past. And as it's a fine day, some of you will probably want to play in the adventure playground. Our latest addition is child-sized tractors. That you can drive around the grounds. We'll also be going into the farm that's part of the estate, where there's plenty to do. Most of the buildings date from the 18th century, so you can really step back into an agricultural past. Until recently, the dairy was where milk from the cows was turned into cheese. It's now the place to go for lunch, or afternoon tea, or just a cup of coffee and a slice of homemade cake. The big stone building that dominates the farm is the large barn, and in here is our collection of agricultural tools. These were used in the past to plow the earth, sow seeds, make gates, and much more. There's a small barn. Also made of stone, where you can groom the donkeys and horses to keep their coats clean. They really seem to enjoy having it done, and children love grooming them. The horses no longer live in the stables, which instead is the place to go to buy gifts, books, our own jams and pickles, and clothes and blankets made of wool from our sheep. Outside the shed, which is the only brick building, you can climb into a horse-drawn carriage for a lovely, relaxing tour of the park and farm. The carriages are well over a hundred years old. And finally, the parkland, which was laid out in the 18th century with a lake and trees that are now well established. You'll see types of cattle and sheep. That are hardly ever found on farms these days. We're helping to preserve them 
to stop their numbers falling further. OK, well, if you'd like to come with me, we will start... Did you make notes while you were watching the performances of Romeo and Juliet, Gemma? Yes, I did. I found it quite hard, though. I kept getting too involved in the play. Me too. I ended up not taking notes. I wrote down my impressions when I got home. Do you mind if I check a few things with you, in case I've missed anything? And I've also got some questions about our assignment. No, it's good to talk things through. I may have missed things too. OK, great. So, first of all, I'm not sure how much information we should include in our reviews. Right. Well, I don't think we need to describe what happens, especially as Romeo and Juliet is one of Shakespeare's most well-known plays. Yeah, everyone knows the story. In an essay, we'd focus on the poetry and Shakespeare's use of imagery, etc. But that isn't really relevant in a review. We're supposed to focus on how effective this particular production is. Hmm. We should say what made it a success or a failure. And part of that means talking about the emotional impact the performance had on us. I think that's important. Yes. And we should definitely mention how well the director handled important bits of the play. Like when Romeo climbs onto Juliet's balcony. And the fight between Mercutio and Tybalt. Yes. It would also be interesting to mention the theatre space and how the director used it, but I don't think we'll have space in 800 words. No, OK. That all sounds quite straightforward. So, what about the Emporium Theatre's production of the play? I thought some things worked really well, but there were some problems too. Yeah. What about the set, for example? I think it was visually really stunning. I'd say that was probably the most memorable thing about this production. You're right. The set design was really amazing. But actually, I have seen similar ideas used in other productions. Mm. What about the lighting? Some of the scenes were so dimly lit it was quite hard to see. I didn't dislike it. It helped to change the mood of the quieter scenes. That's a good point. What did you think of the costumes? I was a bit surprised by the contemporary dress, I must say. Yeah, I think it worked well, but I'd assumed it would be more conventional. Me too. I liked the music at the beginning, and I thought the musicians were brilliant, but I thought they were wasted because the music didn't have much impact in Acts 2 and 3. Yes, that was a shame. One problem with this production was that the actors didn't deliver the lines that well. They were speaking too fast. It was a problem, I agree. But I thought it was because they weren't speaking loudly enough, especially at key points in the play. I actually didn't have a problem with that. It's been an interesting experience watching different versions of Romeo and Juliet, hasn't it? Definitely. It's made me realise how relevant the play still is. Right. I mean, a lot's changed since Shakespeare's time, but in many ways nothing's changed. There are always disagreements and tension between teenagers and their parents. Yes, that's something all young people can relate to. More than the violence and the extreme emotions in the play. How did you find watching it in translation? Really interesting. I expected to find it more challenging, but I could follow the story pretty well. I stopped worrying about not being able to understand all the words and focused on the actors' expressions. The ending was pretty powerful. Yes. That somehow intensified the emotion for me. Did you know Shakespeare's been translated into more languages than any other writer? Hmm. What's the reason for his international appeal, do you think? I was reading that it's because his plays are about basic themes that people everywhere are familiar with. Yeah. And they can also be understood on different levels. The characters have such depth. Right which allows directors to experiment and find new angles. That's really important. Right, everyone. Let's make a start. Over the past few sessions, we've been considering the reasons why some world languages are in decline. 
And today I'm going to introduce another factor that affects languages and the speakers of those languages, and that's technology, and in particular, digital technology. In order to illustrate its effect, I'm going to focus on the Icelandic language, which is spoken by around 321,000 people, most of whom live in Iceland, an island in the North Atlantic Ocean. The problem for this language is not the number of speakers, even though this number is small, nor is it about losing words to other languages, such as English. In fact, the vocabulary of Icelandic is continually increasing, because when speakers need a new word for something, they tend to create one, rather than borrowing from another language. All this makes Icelandic quite a special language. It's changed very little in the past millennium, yet it can handle 21st century concepts related to the use of computers and digital technology. Take, for example, the word for web browser. This is vafri in Icelandic, which comes from the verb to wander. I can't think of a more appropriate term because that's exactly what you do mentally when you browse the internet. Then there's an Icelandic word for podcast, which is too hard to pronounce, and so on. Icelandic, then, is alive and growing, but, and it's a big but, young Icelanders spend a great deal of time in the digital world, and this world is predominantly English. Think about smartphones. They didn't even exist until comparatively recently, but today young people use them all the time to read books, watch TV or films, play games, listen to music and so on. Obviously, this is a good thing in many respects because it promotes their bilingual skills, but the extent of the influence of English in the virtual world is staggering and it's all happening really fast. For their parents and grandparents, the change is less concerning because they already have their native speaker skills in Icelandic. But for young speakers, well, the outcome is a little troubling. For example, teachers have found that playground conversations in Icelandic secondary schools can be conducted entirely in English, while teachers of much younger children have reported situations where their classes find it easier to say what is in a picture using English rather than Icelandic. The very real and worrying consequence of all this is that the young generation in Iceland is at risk of losing its mother tongue. Of course, this is happening to other European languages too. But while internet companies might be willing to offer, say, French options in their systems, it's much harder for them to justify the expense of doing the same for a language that has a population the size of a French town, such as Nice. The other drawback of Icelandic is the grammar, which is significantly more complex than in most languages. At the moment, the tech giants are simply not interested in tackling this. So, what is the Icelandic government doing about this? Well, large sums of money are being allocated to a language technology fund that it is hoped will lead to the development of Icelandic-sourced apps and other social media and digital systems. But clearly this is going to be an uphill struggle. On the positive side, they know that Icelandic is still the official language of education and government. It has survived for well over a thousand years, and the experts predict that its future in this nation-state is sound and will continue to be so. However, there's no doubt that it's becoming an inevitable second choice in young people's lives. This raises important questions. When you consider how much of the past is tied up in a language, Will young Icelanders lose their sense of their own identity? Another issue that concerns the government of Iceland is this. If children are learning two languages through different routes, neither of which they are fully fluent in, will they be able to express themselves properly?